Next, we all speak. And at times, we speak the wrong things. Speaking is important as Christians. We are to guard our hearts, for out of it springs the issues of life, says the book of Proverbs. We are to encourage one another, not let a unwholesome word proceed from our mouths, but only that which is good for edification and according to the need of the moment, Ephesians 4, 29. We are also called to speak the truth to one another, Ephesians 4. We are also called to not let anger and wrath and malice and things like slander and jealousy be spoken in our mouths. And in the book of James, there's something important about what we say. What we say from the book of James is what we believe. And so today, through the book of James, we will help ourselves to understand better how we should speak and how the way we speak can reveal something about our personalities. And even more, it can reveal something about our character in the sight of God. So speaking in arrogance will be the topic for today. So turn with me to the book of James, the book of James, chapter 4, starting in verse 11. It reads, Do not speak against one another, brethren. Do not speak evil against one another. The American Standard Version reads, and it helps us to understand what exactly is being talked about here. Because when we speak against one another, speak evil against one another, that is telling us that our speech needs to be bridled. Our speech needs to be in a certain way. We are not to have <coughs> the type of speech for our brethren that is evil, that is in opposition to one another. That is like you're fighting against someone. Let's see this a little bit differently. When we speak a evil against one another, it's not just lying. This is bigger than that. Speaking evil can be false witness about someone. It can be as little as saying, hey, you know, I heard that such and such a person said this thing. And they come to find that you said that and it's not true. But you're doing it to oppose them because of something you think. Or one could speak malice. Someone can say something bad about a person behind their back. I've known, I've known it to happen to myself a time or two, and then it comes back to me. Anyone ever talk about you behind your back? Maybe at your job? Maybe in your own household? Hopefully that's not the case. Maybe in the brotherhood, someone says that you said something that you really didn't say. Just to oppose you and just to oppose what you think and what you believe. Slander you. Speak evil of you. Someone even may say, you know what? I think you're dumb. I think that you have all these problems. I think you just can't do it. You'll never do it. You'll never be anything. You're nothing. Do those words build you up? Or do they put you down? Are unwholesome words evil? Yes, they are. God commands us to speak wholesome words, things that build us up. But let's look at an example. An example in which we can see it being played out to where Someone is speaking evil. Someone is opposing someone with evil speech 
And then someone returns with the right way to oppose. With the right way. Turn to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. Verse 22. Matthew chapter 16. Verse 22. In this example, we have Jesus, we have our master talking with one of the disciples, one of the apostles. And in it, he's responding to what Peter said to him. Because Peter opposed him. Matthew chapter 16, starting in verse 22. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord. This shall never happen to you. What is he responding to? He's responding to verse 21 where Jesus said that he must suffer and many things from the suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised on the third day. But Peter said he opposed him. That's what he did. He opposed him with evil. Now, this may not come off as that in the beginning, but notice how Christ responds to him. Notice how Christ responds in verse 23. He says, But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. There's nothing good about that. Satan is evil. Satan is the adversary, the enemy of Christ. Peter was opposing, going against Christ. He was speaking evil against Christ. He was speaking him with wickedness. He was telling him, you're not going to do this. And his way was the way of Satan. He was opposing him. He says, you are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. So turn with me back to chapter 4 of James, chapter 4 of James. From that example, we should be able to see that there is a good way and a bad way to oppose somebody. You can oppose somebody with evil by either putting them down, lies, slander, discouraging them to do the will of God like Peter did. All these ways are evil in the sight of God. To oppose somebody. But then you may be asking, what about the other side? The text doesn't necessarily talk about the other side of opposing people, going against somebody, but there is a right way. There is a right way to oppose someone. Let's look at another example Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. Verse 11 and following. We will not read the whole account, but we'll read a few verses. Starting in verse 11 of chapter 2. But when Cephas came to Antioch, Cephas is another name for Peter, the same person that Jesus spoke with, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For prior to the coming of certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision. The rest of the Jews joined him in hypocrisy, with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. 
The end result of this was that Paul opposed Peter and he rebuked him for something that he was doing that was wrong. He was being a hypocrite. Now, what is the proper way to oppose someone? What is the proper way to speak against someone? It is with the truth, just like Jesus did, just like Paul did. We can oppose each other with the truth. We can oppose each other with the truth. But to do it with evil, that is not proper. Return again to James, and we'll continue on in the text. James chapter 4, verse 11. Not yet. Do not speak against one another, brethren. He who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks against the law and judges the law. If we think of this as he who speaks evil in opposition, fighting against his brother or judges his brother, that person speaks evil in opposition to the law. You see, when you are speaking evil to each other, you are opposing the law of God. You are fighting against the law of God. Because what does it say? It says, don't do it. It says you're supposed to have wholesome words. It says you're not supposed to slander. It says you're not supposed to have malice. It says you're not supposed to have gossip and wrath and all these other things having to do with our mouth. And so then, when you do that, you are going against the law. You're going against the law. And you judge the law. But if you judge the law, returning to the text, verse 11, but if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge of it. So putting this together, what is this telling us? It's telling us that when you are opposing your brother with evil words, evil speech, you are also judging the law. But how are you judging the law? Well, it says you're judging the law because you're not a doer of it. So in your mind, you have said, I am not going to do this law. I'm going to do what I want to do. Let me help make sense of this a little bit more. He who speaks against his brother, he who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks against the law and judges the law. You have judged the law and said, I'm not going to do it. And so your judgments, your judgments in speaking are not God's judgments. Your judgments in speaking are not God's judgments. That's what it's saying. When you're speaking evil against your brother, that's not what God wants you to do. And so you're choosing to speak on your own accord. You're choosing to speak according to what you want in your own mind. And on top of that, it says, you are not a doer of the law, you are the judge of it. Verse 12, there is only one lawgiver and judge. The one who was able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? I think if we reflect on this, it'll be very obvious who we are. The question is, who are you to judge your neighbor? 
Well, obviously, you're not the judge because there's only one. You're not the judge because there's only one. So then what are you? You are now a sinner. We are sinners. If we choose to judge with our own judgments, if we choose to speak evil against our brethren, because does it not say in J James chapter 1 that we are to be doers of the word and not hearers only? Doesn't it also say in James chapter 1 that if we are sinners, it's our own fault. We have conceived in our mind because of our desires. And when lust is conceived, it brings forth sin and death. So that's what we are. We are sinners if we choose to judge our neighbor. But notice it also said neighbor. It didn't say brother again, did it? It began with brother in chapter 4, verse 11, but it didn't end with brother. So then who is our neighbor? Isn't that the famous question that the lawyer asked Jesus? Who is my neighbor? And then we have the passage of the Samaritan or well known as the good Samaritan. So then ask yourself, who is your neighbor? Who can you judge? Well, it just comes full circle. There's only one judge. It's Jesus. It's God. They're the ones that judge. We are not the ones that judge. We use their words to judge. Let us continue on in the text. Chapter 4, verse 13. Next slide, please. Come now, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go to such and, and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. You know, there's a real temptation at times to make your plans. Say, I'm going to do this. This is what I want to do tomorrow and next week and next year and five years from now and ten years from now. Planning, planning, planning. All to fulfill what you want to do. All to fulfill what you want to do. But the truth is, you don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. You don't. No one can say they do because they don't. Only God knows. You don't even know if we're going to be alive tomorrow. You don't know if Jesus is coming back. You don't know any of that. But it says here, you are just a vapor. A vapor. That's all you are in the grand scheme of things. You appear for a little while and then you're gone. Verse 15. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. You remember that special thing about James when it says, say? Do you remember that? Anytime you see up until this point, and it continues to be true, the word say is also what you believe. So when you say, if the Lord wills, you also believe that. You believe if it is the Lord's will. And so what does that mean? You have to have some type of accountability to the Lord's will. We live, we would do this or that. I've heard this phrase 
use at the end of a sentence like a period. I'm going to go to the store if the Lord wills. I'm going to go to McDonald's if the Lord wills. I'm going to fill in the blank if the Lord wills. And there's nothing wrong with saying it, but then do you believe it? Do you believe that if it is the Lord's will, but then how do you know the Lord's will? Well, we read it. We understand it. If you go back to the book of Ephesians, it says we must learn in chapter 5 what the Lord's will is. And that's revealed to us through Jesus Christ. And that's here in the text through his holy apostles. Verse 16. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Wow. That's a cause for pause, isn't it? It's telling us that if you choose to make these plans, there's nothing wrong with planning in it of itself. Please don't get me wrong. Planning is good. God himself is a planner. The problem comes in when you do not consider the Lord's will in your plans. You make all these plans in your life to do this and do that, but do you ask, do you pray, is this the Lord's will? Is this what he wants me to do? Is this how he wants me to do it? Because when you make these plans, boasting I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this. I will do this. I will go to such and such a place and conduct business. That's what I will do. You are boasting in your arrogance. You are thinking more of yourself than what is reality. You arrogant person. Because the reality is life is a vapor. You don't know if you're going to be here tomorrow. All such boasting is evil, wicked. Verse 17, therefore, to one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. To him it is sin. So, that just sets you up. That should make the hairs on the back of your neck, on the back of your arms stand up a little bit. Especially if you just understood everything that just came out of my mouth. Because you are now accountable. You are now accountable to do this if you understood what was just given in this lesson. And if you don't do it, you are sinning. You are Sinning. All this, there's a bit of a, a common thread. There's a common thread that runs through each one of these. I want to show your minds these things. Notice the one who judges his brother or speaks against his brother with evil. He opposes him. Who is the judge in that time? Who is the judge at that moment? Is it God or is it you? You're doing the judging. You're doing the evil. And you're not being a doer of the word, but rather a judge of it. Notice also. When you say, come now, let us conduct business, and we'll do this, and we'll do that, who is making that choice? Is it you, or is it God? Well, it's you again. Notice what we learned in previous lessons about fights and quarrels. Whose desire are you taking in? Is it a desire of God, which is the wisdom that comes down? From the Father of Lights, 
He gives all good and all perfect gifts, and that wisdom is pure, that wisdom is innocent, that wisdom is peaceable, that wisdom is unwavering, that wisdom is filled with mercy and reasonable? Or is it the wisdom of the earth? Natural, demonic. Well, it's the wisdom of the earth. Notice where sin comes from. God says he doesn't cause you to sin. So it's of your own self. There's a pattern here in the text that should be seen. We must do things according to the will of God in your words, in your actions. You must consider God in everything you do. If you want to be pleasing to God, this is how we must live our lives. And I'm in the same boat. We're all in it together. We're all in it together. So, brethren, that includes women. Please don't exclude yourself from those sta that statement. This is the solution to making sure that we have peace in our relationship with each other and with God. This is the solution to making sure that we live a life that is in accordance with the will of God. And this is a solution to making sure that we are not opposing God like Peter did on that day. Because those who are proud are enemies of God and those that are humble, God gives grace to. So let us all humble ourselves in the sight of God, doing what is according to his will, judging according to his will, so that we may not be found as sinners in his sight as we stand and as we sing.